Thank you very much, Mr. Cosgrave. I now call on Antishak, uh, Mr. Andrew Kenny, to formally launch this book. Ari Realtish, one of the public leaders, Guinea Ushler Fad. You have no idea the privilege that it is for me, representing the party that I do as head of government, to have the privilege, genuinely a privilege, to, uh, to speak on this occasion here in the Royal Irish Academy. I'm glad to see all the young people here, Mr. Justice Finlay, Mr. Whittaker. <laughs> All of the others who left an indelible mark on Irish society and Irish politics and the Irish people. In 1944, when W.T. Cosgrave retired from public life, the Dublin Opinion featured a cartoon in which Ireland introduced him to an elderly robed figure with the words, Mr. Cosgrave, this is history. I have a kind of feeling he's going to do you rather well. And as Professor Michael Laffin has noted, that as is often the case, history was not in a hurry, but in the long run, while it's taken a while, this forecast has been truly vindicated. So it has. Professor Laffin and the Royal Irish Academy are to be congratulated on a truly wonderful book, beautifully produced to the highest publishing standards, scrupulously researched, lucidly written, and with all the ob objectivity and authority of a professional historian at the top of his game. I say that because I asked another professional historian, <laughs> Morris Manning. <laughs> Professor Manning to give me a, a view about this. And as Morris will recall, in the days of the New Ireland Forum, when the row broke out about particular dates in history, and Mr. Hawhey was most upset and all of those around the table gave their view about the issue in question. And when Professor Manning came to understand what this was, he gave the date perfectly. Whereupon the former Thishik said, far be it from me to cross souls with a professional historian. <laughs> but this book more than justifies the decision of the Academy to embark on the judging series. And following on the earlier volumes by Jim Ferreter and Tom Garvin, it is now firmly established as making a major uh, contribution to our understanding of modern Irish history. And I'm really thrilled to learn that the Academy has commissioned uh, further volumes, as President has pointed out, of John Redmond and Edward Carson. In 1932, a New York writer, New York Times writer, told his readers, only those with first-hand knowledge of Cosgrave's difficulties can appreciate the greatness of this little tawny-headed man who has been in office longer than any prime minister in Europe. And it's only now with the publication of Michael Laffin's book that the full greatness of W.T. Cosgrave and the debt that our country owes him can be fully appreciated. Stephen Collins, with his fine book, The Cosgrave Legacy, began the process of reassessment back in 1996 and now 50 years, five decades after Cosgrave's death, Michael Laffin has given us his magisterial, definitive, and learned judgment. It will not be bettered. Unlike so many of those who later governed the New Ireland, W.T. Cosgrave was not a politician by accident. He chose to go into politics and was elected a Sinn Féin member of Dublin Corporation at the age of 25 in 1905. Dublin Corporation was then as now, an important body in the life of the city, and Cosgrave took his work seriously. As a publican, he might have been more at home in the Irish party, but he was a follower of Arthur Griffith, and he had long lost faith in the Irish party. He was an early member of the Volunteers, but interestingly, interestingly not of the IRB. He never liked secret societies. He took part in the Hoth gun running and was a 1916 man. He fought bravely under Eamon Kant in the South Dublin Union, now St. James's Hospital, as Mr. Cosgrave pointed out, very close to where he lived. And his brother, Gobbon, was also in the South Dublin Union. He was killed by a sniper. A WT was held in Richmond Barracks, court-martialed. The whole process lasted just 15 minutes, 
and sentenced to death by shooting. His sentence was commuted to life imprisonment and he was released in 1917. But he was always proud to be a 1916 man. He saw the rising as a central, formative and defining act in the shaping of modern Ireland. Many of those who were leading figures in the parties that he led, Cumann and Gale and Fine Gale, Richard Mulcahy, Ernest Blythe, Desmond Fitzgerald, Fiona Lynch, and others were also 1916 men, and it was the unshakable conviction of Cosgrave and the other founders of Cumann and Gale that their party was a 1916 party and that it drew its inspiration from the memory of 1916. That too was the view of Liam Cosgrave when he led Fine Gael, and it's my view and the view of the party I have the honour to lead today. But it's important to note that W.T. Cosgrave was neither narrow nor exclusive in his view. He had no difficulty in accepting Fianna Fáil's claim to be a 1916 party also. That, in a way, was the central tragedy of the split that led to the civil war, the sundering of old Sinn Féin, and the horrific consequences for our country. But his inclusivity was wider than that. He welcomed the sons of both John Redmond and John Dillon into his party, and he opened the door to former unionists who found the new free state a cold place. And his government provided funds to help build a memorial in the Phoenix Park to honor those killed in the Great War, not a popular decision in 1920s Ireland. And I would hope that the government I lead has brought the same sense of inclusivity of W.T. Cosgrave to our current decade of centenaries. One of the first public acts of this decade was a ceremony in Waterford to honor John Redmond and the Third Home Rule Act. I've been on record on many occasions in my appreciation of the work and the achievements of the Irish party over more than four decades, 40 years. Their memory should not be a source of division. They were a patriotic party of very substantial achievements who embedded the principles of parliamentary democracy in our people. And their leaders, Isaac Butt, Charles Stuart Parnell, John Redmond, and John Dillon, all deserve to be honored in our collective memory. Indeed, it might be appropriate if in the houses of the Oireachtas, portraits, appropriate portraits of these four leaders were to hang in an appropriate and convenient place as a, as a memory of the work of the, uh, of the Irish party over those four difficult decades that they served uh, their country in the Commons. Um, Cosgrave was elected MP for Kilkenny in 1917, followed by a further 10 months in Gloucester and in Reading jails before becoming Minister for Local Government in the new Dáil administration. And in the words of Michael Laffin, his department would prove to be, second only to Collins's Ministry for Finance, the most important branch of the underground Irish administration. W.T. was now a wanted man with a price on his head and was forced to spend much of his time on the run. There is a brilliant picture of him in this book, minus his moustache, at the Oblate Monastery in Glen Cree, disguised as Brother Doyle. The disguise, however, did not always work. One beggar man stopped him on a Dublin street with the words, spare a copper, Mr. Cosgrave. <laughs> he was the crucial swing vote in the cabinet vote on the treaty, and having made up his mind, his fidelity to implementing that settlement was total. When Michael Collins was killed in 1922, he was the unanimous choice to head the government and he proved to be an uncompromising, even ruthless advocate of the people's right to decide their own fate. On this point, he would remain consistent throughout his entire career. A civil war, as you know, is the most terrible and painful thing that can happen in any country. Ours was no different. And Michael Laffin is even-handed, fair and judicious in his treatment of these years and of the enormous damage done not just to the country's infrastructure, but to its very morale. He concludes, the civil war crippled and poisoned the independent Irish state. It inaugurated a bitter ice age that froze Irish politics for generations. As I grew up myself, did we not hear on so many occasions one side versus the other and the bitterness that that engendered over those generations? And so it did. But all the while, 
W.T. Cosgrove and his small team of ministers had the enormous task of setting up, defending and sustaining the still new and the still fragile free state. It was a Herculean task, which they embraced with courage, with fearless, selfless courage and vision. No government in our history has ever faced such a daunting task and no government has ever been so successful in what it actually achieved. It's not possible at the time available this evening to go into detail about these achievements, but Professor Laffin is vivid, is fair and comprehensive in giving us the full story. It's all there in the book and what a story it is. Within a matter of months, the new government had drafted and enacted our first constitution, a modern rights-based constitution, most of the key elements of which survived into our present Bunracht Neheren. Then there was the task of physically rebuilding the country after the devastation of the civil war and the huge drain that it had on the fragile finances of a new state. There was the building and the rebuilding of the rail lines and the bridges, of roads, of public buildings and much more. By 1929, the General Post Office, the Custom House, the Four Courts and the Public Records Office were all rebuilt. And side by side with that was the task of reviving Irish, to which the government was passionately committed, though not always with success. There too was the establishment of the Irish Manuscripts Commission, an initiative of Owen McNeill to replicate historic documents lost in the burning of the Public Records Office and the establishment of the Irish Folklore Commission, so important to our heritage, so important to our history. A national army was founded, professionalized, and brought firmly under civilian control, even if the government had to face down a mutiny to make this happen. There was the establishment of the unarmed Garda Síochána, set up in the middle of a civil war, a force which quickly gained acceptance and widespread general trust. And the civil service and the local authority commissions were set up to ensure an impartial and merit-based recruitment system to local and to national administration. There was the 1924 Land Act, which completed the work of previous land acts and the transfers of lands to tenant farmers, again reflected in longer-term leasings in the most recent budget by Minister Noonan. But perhaps two of the greatest achievements were the creation of the Shannon Scheme and the role of the new state in international affairs. I found this interesting. The Shannon Scheme and the establishment of the Electricity Supply Board was a venture brave and defiant for its time. Listen carefully. The Irish Times and the Irish Independent of the day said it could not be done and they opposed it tooth and nail. The banks refused to loan money until Paddy McGilligan threatened to nationalise them. <laughs> Happened anyway. The chambers of Commerce warned of financial doom and so on, but they did it. And they struck a hard bargain with Siemens and brought in the project on time and under budget. It was a mighty achievement showing the determination of the new state to go where no British government had dared before that. And I was happy just a short time ago to go down to Arden Russia and stand in the same location with Liam Cosgrave and see the pictures there of himself and his brother with their father in 1928, still up on the wall and some of that machinery still working. And in international terms, W.T. Cosgrove was determined to establish the separate and the distinctive identity of our new state. And so, against British opposition, we became active members of the League of Nations. And more importantly, the government worked within the new Commonwealth of Nations using gains uh, made there as a stepping stone to that full freedom which Collins and which Griffiths had, uh, had envisaged. The irony was that it was Mr. de Valera who reaped the benefit of these successes in the 1930s he was able to dismantle much of the treaty on the basis of powers won by his predecessors through the statutes of Westminster. But then I suppose that's politics for you, as many people would say. Now, this fine book is primarily a biography, the story of one man, and it is one of the delights of the book that a full and rounded picture of W.T. Cosgrave emerges. He was a nice man, a decent man, who was liked by most people across party lines. Not easy these days. He was a man of his word who never lost the common touch. He was sociable. He had no notions of grandeur and he never saw himself 
as being more important than the office that he held. And he could be witty, which he passed on to his son, a very Dublin sort of wit, the one liner that could deflate pomposity or sum up a situation in a single phrase. Within the cabinet, he was the boss, and even though there were some formidable intellects in his cabinet, his authority was never challenged. As Professor Laffin points out, he was in control, even when absent through illness. He listened to his colleagues, but he did not always take their advice. He made up his own mind. He was a matter-of-fact speaker, no flights of oratory, a master of detail, and as a journalist noted in 1929, there is no man in the doll who handles figures with the same dexterous precision as he does. As a theorist, he has many superiors in the house, but as a realist, he has none. Winston Churchill, who had come to know him well, saw him as a quite potent figure, a chief of higher quality than any who had yet appeared. To the courage of Collins, he added the matter-of-fact fidelity of Arthur Griffith and a knowledge of practical administration and state policy all his own. But perhaps it was the writer V.S. Pritchard who got him best, and he said, the perfect exemplar of the ordinary man suddenly elevated to high office, who had the inborn moral character that is required for rule. Or as his son, Liam T. Cosgrave put it, an extraordinary, ordinary man. The author in what is almost a throwaway line, but one which you will empathize with, I'm sure, says that it seemed to be Common Gael's destiny to govern in hard times. Many hard decisions had to be taken, hardships imposed, and reforms made. And as Cosgrave himself remarked, and I really agree with this, after five years in office, all reforms make enemies, few make friends. But it can be said too, and he realized this in retirement, that he and his government should have paid more attention to the public mood, or in the word of today's politics, their presentation might have been better. I'm not sure it was a concept that Ernest Blythe would have bought into. <laughs> he reflected too in retirement that maybe he should have put more time into the party management and organization. Perhaps he should, and certainly party organization atrophied in his time in opposition. But he did always put country before party, something not always popular with his own backbenchers and his own supporters. The historian Dermot Kyo has written, it has been argued that Cosgrave and his colleagues regarded the state finances has been too serious a business to be the subject of party political considerations. This was, writes Kyo, an era of relative innocence. Perhaps it was, but we know now that in a very profound way they were right, and we know too well the consequences of ignoring this approach. His final two years were dominated by world economic depression. Michael Laffin sums it up. The national debt was comparatively low, Ireland's credit rating amongst the strongest in the world, the free state's experience of the crisis was less catastrophic than that of several other countries, but the 1932 election would prove that many voters were unimpressed by such comparisons. A man in big boots and a, a loose jacket called to me a number of years ago with a sheet of paper in his hand. He said, I was rooting up in the attic upstairs and I found this under the lino. Lino used to be the big business. And there it was, the poster from the 1932 election for the constituency of Mayo, headed up by the immortal words, the gambler never pays his debts, don't let him pay again, vote for coming ill. <laughs> and indeed, as indeed was the case, he lost that election and would never hold office again. Many see the peaceful change of government from civil war winners to civil war losers as possibly his greatest achievement, as his son has pointed out and marked an important stage in the maturity of our new state. He had earlier expressed a view that a change of government would be a good thing and that it would be good for the country if Fianna Fáil had at last to take responsibility. Write that down. <laughs> Mind you, he had no idea it would take so long to get them out of office. He led the opposition until his retirement in 1944. These were not prosperous years for Fine Gael. But after 10 of the hardest years ever endured by any government, many of his colleagues were simply worn out and may have felt that, in a sense, their duty to their country had been done and their legacy intact. He was a responsible leader of the opposition. 
and he continued to have what the author described as an admirable tendency to distinguish between willingness to promise and capacity to deliver. He took a strong, he took a strong pro-neutrality line in support of the government in the wartime years, even if this meant parting company with his colleague James Dillon. He retired from politics in 1944, and his retirement was total. He was never again involved in politics or sought to influence events from the sideline. It was a happy retirement, very well described in this book. He liked to go racing. The author recounts one delightful story he shared when he, of a day he shared at the bench with the poet Patrick Kavanagh at the Phoenix Park races. They sat in silence for some time until Kavanagh eventually broke the silence. Forgive me intruding, Mr. Cosgrave. I know all about intrusions. People are constantly intruding on me in pubs and everywhere else, and I know how evil it is. But I would just like to tell you that I have admired you all my life. You're a gentleman. To his surprise and delight, Cosgrave turned and answered, Ah, Mr. Kavanagh, I know your work, of course, and I admire it very much. It is no intrusion at all, I assure you. It gives me great pleasure to meet you. They shook hands and relapsed into respective silences. <laughs> he died in 1965, peacefully and with his family. The last word on W.T. Cosgrave is perhaps best left to his old political adversary, Sean Lamass. Then Taoiseach, a dub like himself, and a man who would never express an emotion that he did not feel. They had become friends. They had much in common. Despite their past differences, Lamas would occasionally turn to him for advice. He said the privations and the sacrifices which he endured so that the national freedom might be ours, the capacity he displayed in presiding over the administration while responsibility was his, the grace with which he handed over responsibility when the people so willed, the dignity with which he carried out his duties as leader of the opposition and later as a private member of this house, the generosity of spirit with which he lent his hand to the defense of the state in a time of national danger. He was a great Irishman, one of our greatest, and this book is worthy of its subject. My privilege indeed. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to thank you. I'd like to make this presentation on all your behalves uh, to Liam Cosgrave. It is the first cheque of the national loan signed on the 10th day of March 1922, signed by W.T. Cosgrave for the sum of £428.17 and one penny.